it's, it's the big question many people have is, what does the October Gallery have to do with Biosphere 2? And that's a very easy question to answer, and I'm going to let Mark deal with that. But the October Gallery is actually part of a much larger group called the Institute of Architectics. And again, Mark, I hope, will deal with what the Institute of Architectics is all about. <coughs> um, Mark is an important speaker because he comes back. Mark was actually here right at the very beginning of the October Gallery, which is 40 years ago, 1979, when the place was a complete mess. And if the Institute of Architects does anything, it's they take things that are dilapidated and need a bit of care, and they bring them back up to speed, perhaps. Mark will tell you about that, too. Um, but I thought, he's very special in the sense that Tonight we have a speaker who actually has done something that none of us have done, which is they've lived in another world. Mark is a survivor from a completely different world, and he comes tonight to talk to us about some of those experiences. And that makes me think, because I was a scientist once, but then I became a literary type, that makes me think of, of science fiction, when Mark is a survivor of a science fiction tale. Um, and science fiction, well, science fiction has actually had quite a long past. It goes back, really, to the tale. Somebody who goes and has an experience and comes back and tells you about that experience. And it frightens you or it delights you or whatever, whatever. They tell you about distant places, they tell you about faraway spaces. And most of the tales of the, of the European tradition, and the, the Russian tradition too, were tales of seafaring folks. And we have a lot of, I know, looking around, we have quite a lot of mariners. I can see them around in the audience tonight. Um, one of the things that when they tried to make Biosphere 2, one of the things they did was they trained people on board the Institute's ship, the RV Heraclitus. Because it's a small group of people who, whatever happens, the storms that come, whatever happens, they have to get on. Because saving that ship is the only thing that they know will keep them alive. So they have to work together on a common objective. The other place that Mark worked was a terrestrial, basically a crew, again, a ship, like an odyssey, an odyssey, a voyage out in Australia. And he trained out there too. That's how you grow your plants and things. That's the story I think Mark is going to tell us tonight. Um, and maybe he'll even talk about the octopus. And the reason I wanted to talk about the octopus is because those ship tales, those mariners' tales. The great one, of course, is the rhyme of the ancient mariner. This man comes back and he grabs a wedding guest who's about to go to a wedding, and he has a story he has to tell him. And the wedding guest just wants to go, the wedding guest just wants to go to the wedding, but he has to listen to the tale. And the question is, why does he have to tell the tale? He has to tell the story of what he's been through, what he's seen. And there's that wonderful moment when the wedding guest, who can't get in because the mariner's got him, says, I, I fear the ancient mariner and the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look'st thou so? And the mariner says, with my crossbow, I shot the octopus. Now, he didn't actually say that. He said, I shot the albatross. <laughs> but uh, albatross, albatross, don't forget, doesn't rhyme with thus. So I hope that Mark will tell us the tale of those faraway places, and I hope he will, in fact, tonight, tell us the true story of the octopus. Thank you for coming out. I have to say this perhaps is my favorite place to speak, because I am a big fan of the October Gallery. Uh, now, after Jesse's uh, incredibly erudite, witty, and uh, over-the-top inter introduction, I kind of feel like, uh, let's see, Odysseus. But I don't think I'm going to tell you about monsters. But maybe, you know, maybe that's appropriate because I've been reading, you know, I put Anthropocene, or Anthropocene as you prefer, in the title, and apparently there are a lot of people who are really nervous about it. So the basic concept is that the human impact on our biosphere is so great that there's a serious debate among geologists that we should rename the era that we're in to be the Anthropocene. 
And I think that's kind of a good introduction because I'm going to walk you through 50 years of adventure. I think Odysseus was only 10. Yeah, God, Piker. He may have, you know, survived the Cyclops, etc. And, you know, the work uh, at virtually every step of the way was really uh, linked to our feeling that the Anthropocene was what we're dealing with. So I, I enter this picture as a 22-year-old. I come to New Mexico, and there's a group of people with great energy, and we start work, and four years later, we decide to incorporate an institute of ecotechnics. Now it's in the UK as of almost 30 years ago. And we were impelled by the uh, deep apperception that the world of technology was really out of balance with the world of life. And that has been a through line, as you'll see, through the, all of the projects that we have done. And we're kind of optimists, and, and the idea was, we know enough about ecology, you know, science is never ending, we will never know everything about the biosphere or about the universe. Uh, but we know enough to do a lot better job of managing our relationship with the biosphere than we are. And I wanted to put in this slide, it's mainly, I'm not a narcissist, but everybody involved with ecotechnics could throw up a series of slides of them doing wild stuff, and usually by hand, a few of these, I see Sophia laughing, who is a, a veteran of the outback at Bergman Downs, but, you know, the real joy of it was twofold for me. One is learn by doing. So we were open to, we did have standards. We finally decided the lowest level you could be and, you know, come and work at an ecotechnics project is willing and competent. If you're unwilling, there are other social agencies for you. And I have to say, I, I arrived as a New York City kid, 22 years old, overeducated with an Ivy League degree, and I knew how to do nothing. Perfect. No conditioning that we have to <laughs> erase. And the other thing, which I, I want to get in early in this talk, but really appealed to me, was the idea, and this, this followed out at all of our projects, was we're not just going to do one thing. We're going to work on ecology, we're going to work on theater as an art expression, and we're going to work on enterprise so that these projects can be basically self-funding uh, self and hopefully open-ended. So this was my first ecotechnic uh, field project. It was in New Mexico, and I had never seen anything as scary <laughs> as this. This, uh, this is a, a very close to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it was a much lusher ecology before the Spanish brought their sheep, before the Anglos came in with their cattle, and, it, you know, it, it's a tale, unfortunately, uh, that's are true around the world. So in each, each of our projects, you know, I think we, we keep on learning because we set very high goals. So the modest goal at this ravaged ranch that was so poor that they sold us 60 hectares of it with a lot of buildings and two good water supplies for $50,000 in 1969, was we're going to make an oasis in the desert. Now that, if you know anything about uh, the ecology of the world, would be pushing the ball uphill. Because, uh, unfortunately, the tracks of many, many human civilizations has been deserts. It's been rolling or letting entropy <laughs> slide along with mismanagement, greed, etc. So, I, you know, um, we believe in potentiality, so after a month of trials there, they put me in charge of gardens and trees. So I can attest that we planted over a thousand trees, built you know many, many adobe buildings. We met Bucky Fuller, he'll come back into the story. And uh, this is what the ranch looks like you know, 25, 30 years later. Now, we're a small institute. I think, you know, at any time, there's, there's less than 50 members of the institute. But we have big ideas and big ambitions. So what's the logical thing, you know, now that we're in the process of making an oasis out of the desert? Build a ship, of course. Now, to me, by the way, uh, even 
humans just getting together with flour and water and, and you know, uh, some yeast and making bread was kind of miraculous, and we built buildings. But, so the next heroic step was, but of course, if you want to be an institute of ecotechnics, how could you ignore the ocean? And I do want to acknowledge in the front row here, we have Christine Hunt Day, the expedition chief with 30 years of, of living and sailing, and Captain Klaus Tober with only 25 years. And, and we have other, other mariners and veterans of the Heraclitus uh, in the audience. And the Heraclitus has done just heroic work, just incredible. Uh, go on the website to take a look at all the expeditions. Uh, in th this slide is down in Amazon, and the, that is the Golden Gate. The ship came back to Oakland where it was built about 28 years and probably 200,000 miles, nautical miles, I should say, of sailing. And now it's at a really interesting phase. We're calling it Heraclitus 2.0 because after many extensive dry docks, it's basically been taken down to the keel. And this is happening in, in Rosas uh, in Catalonia in Spain. And that was the ship being lifted up into the dry dock and this amazing sculpture that is merely awaiting some funds if you know people who want to fund a really innovative, innovative ship. Uh, and uh, waiting for its cement to get back into the water, hopefully in two years. Now, as Jesse was saying, after New Mexico, I, I'm a proud alumni. I, I sailed three months with the ship, went through a hurricane, and I guess there's no minor hurricanes. It was a hurricane at the beginning of the first Atlantic crossing. But I went to the outback. And, you know, the really beautiful thing, uh, and we really encourage people who work with us to go from one ecotechnic project to another is uh, this, this uh, area that we're up in the Kimberley, this is Northwest Australia, is basically a tropical version of the devastation that I had seen, we had seen uh, not only Sinegar Ranch, but pretty much the entire Southwest. But this is a tropical savanna. So I had to kind of relearn a, a huge amount of things to adapt to this climate. You know, Santa Fe, five inches sometimes. Here we get 26 inches average rain, sometimes 60, sometimes 12. But that's concentrated in five months, and there's seven months with usually not a drop of, uh, of moisture. And at all our projects, you know, we're really big into training and educational outreach. I, I wanted to feature th that aspect of Birdwood Downs. Now, by the way, I want to talk about I should say, this institute began with, very, and still has, very little money. So it's really helpful when you decide that your ecotechnic test cases are going to be in really devastated areas, because the land values reflect that. So 50,000 for uh, 60 hectares and a lot of buildings. This was pretty much bare land, but this land was considered so valuable that the Australian government gave it to us for four dollars a hectare. But the, the catch was that we had to figure out how to do pasture improvement on half the property, which took an enormous amount of learning. And that learn by doing also includes giving people the freedom to do something new and to make mistakes. And I really have to say, I think that's one of the scary things now is we give we give, somehow we transmit to young people that they, they should lower their expectations of, you know, always there's the rah, 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 live out your dreams uh, kind of story. And people are afraid to make mistakes. My God, I'm going to lose the job, and if I lose that job, I don't have a job. In the Institute, we kind of encourage intelligent mistakes. If you keep making the same mistake, this is a problem. But you know, since, since we're taking on projects where conventional solutions, economics and ecological solutions have been shown to fail, we have to make mistakes because we have, there's no operating manual, there's, no one has demonstrated how to do this. So we had great success and have great success with Kim, Kimberly Youth, heavily Aboriginal, because we give them station skills and the Aboriginals you know, went through a period when they were the great horsemen, you know, two-thirds of the cowboys on these outback stations, 
aboriginals. You know, the land is their religion. Uh, Chile and I and, and Sophia, I think that's all the Aussies we have here, can tell you amazing stories about being with aboriginals in the outback. And these Kimberly kids, you know, Western education usually fails, but you know, when we're teaching them how to, you know, deal with horses and cattle and, and, and restore the land, it's music to their ears. So again, uh, you know, we have created what we call a pastoral oasis, a lot of work, a lot of work, incredible amounts of work in the tropic heat. And speaking of tropics, uh, what kind of an institute wouldn't look at the rainforest and what's happening to the rainforest? So we chose uh, to do a project in Puerto Rico, great cooperation from the government, because the sad fact is Puerto Rico is now the most heavily reforesting country in the world. And they have lost their wood and timber industry, very convenient you know, for the U.S., which is the colonial master, because Puerto Rico, despite all its forests, brings in 99% of its wood from the U.S. and Canada. So our thought was we're, we're, we bought about 400 hectares of secondary forest that's considered pretty useless to minimally disturb, and we, we, we planted about 40,000 trees on one third of the property. As in our other ecological projects, we leave some of the land as kind of a long-term control to see how it regenerates. And we also have some techniques we're trying out to speed up the uh, maturation of valuable uh, hardwoods, native ones, in the, in the forest. So this has been the Endeavor, beautiful project. I, I've had the great thrill of getting lost in the forest and, and helping with research papers there. But you know, it was hit very heavily by uh, Hurricane Maria. So we're in the process of rebuilding. We haven't even been able to really assess the you know, situation with all of our planted uh, trees. But they had started a couple years ago. As I said, there's no wood industry. And even beautiful 100-year-old, 80-year-old teak trees, mahogany trees, you know, when they start ripping up a foundation, they get cut down and they get ground up and sent to landfills. So a few years ago, even before the, the two hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico, you know, they, we started a, a commercial out branch called Puerto Rico Hardwoods. I'm giving you the website there uh, to reclaim these woods. And so this some picture. There's a FEMA truck, you know, dumping some of these woods. Forty percent of the trees in Puerto Rico have been knocked down by the by the forest. So we had invested in sawmills to do the trees up at Las Casas, is the name of that project. Uh, and so these are a few pictures. And I, I, I threw one in of that grain. If you're wondering what that swirly thing is, it's not a, it's not a delta of the, of the uh, Amazon. They're dealing with not only trees that we know. There's 25 to 30 trees, many of which are, are in fact, uh, native trees to Puerto Rico that are so spectacular. So spectacular. And the sad story is, I'm going to try to get some publicity, maybe in The Ecologist, is the forces that be have tried to stop the entire wood reclamation effort. So you'd think that they, the government, we have great allies there, the forestry department, etc. but um, that fight still continues. But an amazing project that has started to change Puerto Rican sensibility about you know, that we are a forest, a forest island. Okay, so here we go to the connection. Now, I, I usually <coughs> when I introduce this, say that, and this was not a joke, and maybe there are outposts. It used to be if you took an ecologist into Chicago, they'd look around in all seriousness, I mean modern Chicago, and say, this is an oak hickory biome. Mm. So, the introduction that uh, <laughs> you're an ecologist, just like you know, if we were just terrestrial based, it would kind of jaundice our view of the ecology and the ecosystem, the biosphere of planet Earth. That's the kind of shape that old-fashioned ecologists would be in. So we early on decided we needed to be in a city, and I have to say, even though I'm a New Yorker, London is one of the preeminent. Uh, uh, world 
12 cities. So there are two anthropogenic biomes. We've already heard anthro. Anthropogenic means that these are human-created biomes, and they're huge. Uh, 30 to, well, 30 percent is just cattle grazing. 40 percent of the land area of the biosphere is now converted to farming and ranching. And I think uh, Masameros, more or less, 3 percent is in built up, you know, towns, villages, cities. So we wanted to be in the world city, and because our naivete is, if you segregate art and science, you're just impoverishing both groups of people. So we wanted to have a project which would be a meeting place for science and art, and that happens a lot in the events here. Uh, as you'll hear, we've had a number of meetings that have used the Artillery Gallery. But we wanted to be a, an art gallery with a difference. And if you're new to the October Gallery, you may not have heard this word, the trans vanguard. So the mission from the beginning, when this was a really stinky old Victorian orphanage that looked for every, every uh, appearance was finally going to give up to the, the mildew and the, the dry, dry rot. rot. Yes, that was the magic, terrible word. <laughs> dry rot was, let's have an art gallery that showcases the avant-garde artists of the world and get those brilliant cutting edge artists out of the box of being ethnic artists. And you know, that's been the mission, you know, and it, it's actually kind of rocked the, uh, the art world, I think, after this time. We also wanted to work in the Mediterranean biome, and it turned out to be we, we acquired a place that was an excellent uh, locale for the uh, two dozen or more Institute of Ecotechnics uh, projects. Now the Mediterranean, you think, well, this is kind of a piece of cake, except that these small holdings, now this is on a scale of seven hectares, these are considered uneconomic and land prices and urban development and you know gentrification, et cetera, these are falling. And you know there are places in the world where really truly wonderful cultural landscapes have been evolved, and, and that was a story. So we kind of restored the uh, the uh, cultural landscape. You know, little woods, Frenchmen go out there, shoot your pigeons, rabbits. You know, even though it might be like half a half an acre, a fifth of a hectare. You know, but but actually a really wise uh, ecological diversity and. I don't have a close-up of it. I think you'll see it later. I love that that house is not a chateau. No, it's not a castle. That was a prosperous French farmer's house from about three centuries ago. My, my, how we have increased the standard of living around the world. It's just wonderful. Uh, yeah, so you can kind of see it. Uh, huge, huge. Uh, so we started having conferences back in 1974, and quite uh, unabashedly, part of our reason was we wanted to educate ourselves. And if you have a conference, then you get to invite your heroes, whether they be in science, exploration, different cultures, art, and bring them together, off the record. And people at the top of their field, I, I hear that Bernard Carr is here. Yes. Bernard was one of our, you were at the Cosmos conference. Yes. In 1983. Anyway, you know, it's fantastic. And it, I was kind of amazed because in the early days, and I've been the chairman since 82, and I was briefly in the mid 70s, scientists, you know, when they're really at the top of the field, they're eager to kind of jump the boundaries and see the bigger picture. You know, nobody wants to be segregated. I mean, Lo Jim Lovelock, uh, you know, had that wonderful word, academic apartheid. Well, it's even worse if you separate and you know, you know, the artists are going to meet over there and the scientists over here. Totally, totally insane. Now, it turned out that this was also a really great strategy for networking with, you know, the top people in their field when a large project like Bias for Two might come. So this is Bucky Fuller at, this is our galactic conference. I, I told you, Ecotechnics thinks big. So we had astronomers and we gave them the topic, Deserts of the Galaxy. I said, there's not a whole lot of data there. You know, do your best, do your best, you know. Uh, mix, mix it up. And Bucky Fuller, of course, was a big inspiration. He gave the word synergy 
Well, he didn't invent synergy, but he certainly popularized it. And it's a beautiful description, too, of echo techniques and any approach that is you know, working the other way. And I think life actually is an anti-entropic um, uh, entity and, and force on the planet. Entropy is everything gets disordered and run down. But life has been evolving with greater complexity and the spread of life for four billion years. And a synergetic system is one w where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So, uh, wonderful stuff. Now, bias for two, and you know, so let me say, uh, and I always like talking to younger people because maybe you didn't see all of the uh, misreporting on Biosphere when it was a, a headline story around the world. But one of the, you know, I, I promise you this was going to be a complex project, a complex talk. Biosphere 2 had multiple purposes. One was to advance what we thought should be a new science of biospherics, how do biospheres operate. And one of our inspirations at our conferences, we had a lot of really great space scientists and astrogeologists, and we started hearing about comparative planetology. I think that's now second nature. You're not surprised by reading a story about why Mercury and Mars or Venus have had different life histories, as it were, than Earth. Well, we said, well, why not comparative biospherics? Now, of course, let's go back to the opening and why you might be a little bit, and you should be a little bit worried. The human impact on the planet is as if we don't have any problem. It's ignoring that it is our life support system. So one of the things about comparative biospherics was let's do testing Let's make ecology more experimental by building a new type of laboratory, a laboratory to study the global ecology. Now, incidental, space settlement, space colonies. This was such an irresistible story that it kind of became what the media really ran with. And I confess, I think we have a destiny in space, maybe in the question period, you know, we can duke it out. But I think actually the effort to put biospheres in space will teach us so much more, again, about biospheres on Earth. So that was one of the, the intentions. To have a separate world, as, as Jesse well described it, you have to be separated from this one. So it had to be materially closed, which means that everything has got to recycle. So we knew that we would be in the market for using the best of eco-technologies and perhaps invent some new ones. And then Biosphere 2, really, this is true, people, uh, was designed to be a really quiet research project. Because it was privately financed, we were going to make our money back by selling Biosphere 3 or 4 or 5 to Disney, to Tokyo, to London, to Los Angeles, places where millions and tens of millions of people happily come. Uh, Southern Arizona is, ha is visitable, unless you're really into suffering and heat, for about four months of the year. So this is not an ideal location, but one photographs and the model of the biosphere that we had built during, during the design period were put up against the backdrop. It looked for all the world like it was already <coughs> there. So we started having, and I call them biosphere pilgrims, and they started finding us and, and coming up the driveway in tens, dozens, hundreds, then thousands, and we realize we're in the business of biospheric education. And I think you know it's not the you know the genius, although there was some genius in, in uh, my colleague John Allen that you'll be seeing soon in inventing it. I think the biosphere too, and <coughs> it, we started it in '85. It took six years of research and development and construction. We had our first closure in '91. It touched a nerve around the world. There was the excitement of real-time science, and I think also there was this excitement of people around the world to try to understand how it is that people and their technology could live in a little mini biosphere. So I, I, if nothing else, the fact that a billion people were told you know, saw the re-entry after the two years. We, we were touching minds around the world. And Biosphere 2 is inherently a very optimistic uh, project. You know, I also like to say you could very simply call it the ultimate ecotechnic experiment. 
could we put all this technology and life together, wilderness, wilderness systems, a farm, humans, all the technology to do a, an artificial or a man-made world together and have a happy outcome? Of course, we knew that there would be surprises, perhaps really grave ones. I mean, at one point we were even thinking Visor 2 may fail and we'll build another one or, you know, uh, what might be surprising is that the work, you know, that so much worked as predicted. So I wanted to, to also give you some of the historical context and hopefully, you know, if anyone's out there feeling that they're about to give in to despair about this, the, the situation with our planet, there are a lot of sciences that came together and are coming together that one, you know, puts bias for two in its context and these, these are still shaping our world, the world of science and and the understanding that we need to have. So on your left, is that right? No. On your left, yes. Uh, Vladimir Vernadsky, how many people in this room know the name? Well, there's a few, there's a few of the IE people, you don't, all right, not, not too many, but a few. Vernadsky is as famous in Russia and Eastern Europe as Darwin is, for openers. Now, uh, and even people like Lynn Margulis and Jim Lovelock, who had advanced the Gaia hypothesis, when they found out about Vernadsky's work, they said, oh, he's, he's our forerunner for sure. I'm not sure that he believed in Gaia, but what Vernadsky did was revolutionize our idea of what a biosphere was. And I grew up in a generation where I think the formulation was, isn't life, you know, aren't we as a life form on Earth so lucky that we happen to pick a habitable planet? You know, just look at it. What Vernadsky, who started, uh, Professor Hill was mentioning biogeochemistry, he's the originator of it because he was a geochemist. And he went around the world and he began discovering that what people, what other scientists had thought were mineral deposits were in fact mediated by life. So he revolutionized the whole concept of, and it's really our modern concept of the biosphere, and he called life a force, you know, a, a powerful force that has transformed the surface of the planet. So it's a really radical uh, idea. And the guy on the other side is Claire Folsom, <coughs> and that flask he's holding up, he was the first that he was joined by other microbiologists who decided for scientific inquiry and curiosity to enclose small swaths of aquatic and marine environments, terrestrial ones, to see, you know, give them some light, make sure they don't overheat or freeze, what would happen? And I think it was unexpected, but what he found is, if you start with just a few species selected, they will crash. The diversity that we find in nature, which is almost beyond reckoning, means that these flasks are continuous. So Claire died, unfortunately, in the early 90s. He, he worked in Hawaii. His flasks were sent over to Biosphere 2, and even though they'd been in his laboratory for 30 years, they still had a lot of kick to them. You know, they had to be boxed up. They were going through color changes, and they're, they're still, they're still uh, functional. And Claire became an important advisor to the project. Now the other science that began was right after space flight is suddenly uh, people started to think, well, how do we live in space? So both NASA, the Europeans, the US Air Force, and especially the Russians began working on life support systems that could extend the possibility of long flights and even living eventually <coughs> in space. And it turned out that the most advanced work was in the Soviet Union. And because I went there, our uh, kind of affiliated publishing company, Synergetic Press, had done a, a small translation of Vernadsky that kind of opened the doors. So we got the incredible cooperation of the two top uh, space bioregenerative institutes, one in Moscow and the other one in Siberia, which would, had been a closed system. A closed city, rather. <laughs> closed city. The Soviet Union was working on being a closed system. That didn't work out very well. The top photograph uh, is the first of four international meetings we had. It was at the Royal Society. 
And it was kind of a good neutral ground. We had the top Russians, we had NASA people, Europeans, etc., and, and Biosphere 2 researchers. And then the Russians came to Biosphere 2. And that last slide, uh, the, the gentleman in the hat is John Allen, who uh, a founding director of the Institute also basically invented the idea. And Oleg Gizenko, who was like the father confessor and therapist and friend to all the cosmonauts, who had an enormous understanding of the human factor in isolated groups. Now, two other disciplines which really feed, fed into uh, bias for two, and I think are also really interesting, is that there's a long history in ecology of building microcosms and mesocosms to uh, get insights into larger, larger systems. And ecological engineering is the idea that we can use engineering and its process efficiency analysis, but ecological because we want to use natural functions because they're more reliable, they're cheaper, to prevent pollution and to make an interface so that human activities aren't harmful. H.T. Odom you know, is the father of ecological engineering, and after Biosphere, he, he uh, worked on research and his students did of Biosphere 2. I went and did my PhD with him. So bias for two, and I've already kind of laid the grounds. From the, from the Russians, we already had the concept that biomes are the building blocks of the planet. So in making a new world, we decided that we would have five wilderness biomes, very small analogs, a anthropogenic biome. We needed to, to grow the food for the eight people inside the farm, and a human habitat that we really thought of as a micro city. And the first battle with the engineers when they saw the, the architectural drawings was, you're asking us to do the impossible and now you're presenting us with a really challenging architecture. Why don't we just build a big Tesco? Is that the equivalent to a Walmart? <laughs> and we were saying, you know, okay, we have a lot of, uh, in, in my culture, chutzpah, daring, to even attempt this project. And we're not gonna make the first human design biosphere be ugly. So uh, really the architecture, which was a delight to live with, was also an homage to world architecture. Step ziggurats, you know, from the Middle East, the geodesic dome, uh, AKA uh, Bucky Fuller, and also Babylonian uh, uh, vaulted structures. It had to be uh, sunlight driven because uh, that's how our biosphere operates. Now, I took this almost as a joke. When the Russians first came to Biosphere, they said, uh, we love this project, but you've given it the wrong name. It shouldn't be called Biosphere 2. It should be Noosphere 1. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that, should I even do the survey? OK, nobody knows what Noosphere is, which is great, because I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> quickly. Uh, Noosphere, now this is again Vernadsky and a couple of other thinkers, including Terry Shadan. You know, saw that you know because of the human impact on the biosphere that what was urgently needed and balance that with the Anthropocene is that a sphere of intelligence, not so much to manage the biosphere but to manage humanity and its impact, our technologies, our farms, our relationship with the biosphere. So they said Noosphere one, and I you know I have to say and. Of course, this is a little bit of a, a book plug for later. In my book, I, I spell this out how radical Biosphere 2 was and perhaps how successful, even if we didn't do a closure. Because we got these engineers to accomplish all of the technical tasks that they had to, had to achieve with two requirements. Number one, nothing could go into Biosphere that has outgassing or out byproducts that the biosphere can't handle safely. We got a solution that violates that, we don't want to hear about it. And number two is technology had its place. The entire technosphere in Biosphere 2 had you know, one basic job, which was to support and enhance life, provide the environmental conditions, maybe move water, do some RO where we needed. But basically, every bit of technology was put in there in the service of life. Now, of course, in my book, I'm saying, that's revolutionary, and I don't know why we don't ask engineers to do that, ask demand. So these, these engineers at first kind of rebelled, because engineers, the, the high side of engineering is we build bridges that don't fall down. You know, we, build, we build stuff that safeguards human life. 
And when they realized that despite all their really inventive and you know, out of the box engineering, it was going to be the soil microbes and the aquatic microbes and the, and the plants and the animals that were going to keep Biosphere 2 healthy, they were kind of appalled. You know, we're not in control. But I think Biosphere 2 is a, a great example, even in a, I should have said, it, it's about uh, one and a quarter hectares in extent. It's really, it's a small world. High ceilings to get as much atmosphere. But once they got the total context, they loved it. I mean, and I think the ecologists will get to that in a minute. They love working with engineers. So one of the technologies uh, that came out of this was air purification using biochemicals. So if you know the term soil uh, um, sick building syndrome, um, that was one of our great fears. If you actually seal this thing really tight, you could have a buildup of trace gases. And we turned to a technology, and we kind of advanced it, because uh, in, in Germany especially, they had learned that putting smoky, nasty, malodorous factories and sewage plants put the exhaust air through soil and, you know, the microbes will digest all of that stuff. So we did that and we coupled it with growing plants because we can spare a big area uh, only doing soil purification. This was one of the first spin-off uh, products intended. Looks like a landscape planter, but underneath there's a little fan that pushes the air and you know, if we had a good GCMS, we could like analyze what the trace gas buildup is in this room. The beautiful thing about this kind of a ecotechnic or ecological engineering, you don't have to tell the microbes what to do. Whatever the trace gases are, and you know, this, this computer is out gassing for sure. We're out gassing everything. They will have populations to respond to it. So the other exciting thing about even the design process is we had to get ecologists to speak engineering and engineers to understand ecology. And because we're you know, launching into the unknown, of course we use a lot of the you know, sort of standard analyses of ecosystems and populations. But all the designers species packed because nobody knew you know, making a rainforest you know, in Arizona, what kind of species losses we'd have. And they put in more, more species with the hope that we could maintain food webs. So Biosphere 2 is not cute gardens. It's not a botanical garden. Anything that is going to live in there uh, is going to be part of a food chain and has to be supported by a food chain. And we measured 11,000 plants both and mapped them before closure and after closure. Quick tour, the rainforest. So Sir Ian Prance, uh, was our main rainforest designer. And this was lovely because he involved New York Botanic Garden where he was then a vice president and then he moved over to Direct Q. So we had two of the great uh, rainforest or the great botanical gardens in the world working on it. The savannah biome, the echoes of uh, Birdwood Downs, was kind of a composite, although we did get uh, species from Birdwood Downs of Kimberley. This was the one that we knew would be the nail biter, is make a coral reef at uh, basically a thousand meters elevation in southern Arizona. Really? Okay. Uh, so it took a lot of tender loving care. You know, we had to, we had divers in there weeding algae. We uh, were chemically buffering against, because we had elevated CO2. But never, and we had some innovative nutrient uh, scrubbing uh, technologies. I don't have time to go into that. But the really outstanding thing is that at the end of two years, there were new coral colonies. Little overview of the of the ocean, and we also had this. This became one I totally fell in love with. We decided to have a wetland, but you know, being wiser too, we've got to do the ultimate wetland. So we collected in the Everglades, and we truncated about. 20 to 30 miles of ordinary estuary from freshwater to red mangrove through seven salinity gradients to where it came to the ocean. And then we had a fog desert uh, modeled on Baja, California, and even an ecotone, a thorn scrub. Another of my favorite, of course, every biospherian worked two to four hours, five days a week growing our food. 
But our intensive agricultural system, our consultant who is an expert in Chinese, one of the most traditional Chinese is like the gold standard of ecological high yield. He calculated that we might have been the most productive half acre, which is the fifth of a hectare farm in the world. But what was really delightful about it was not only sitting down to a meal where you knew every plant that was on that uh, table from seed or, or start to harvest to processing, was that was, again, in a closed system where all the nutrients were returned. And we had to go beyond organic standards. I've done organic. We have an, a certified organic operation in New Mexico. We can not even use some of the, the compounds and, and approaches that organic uses because Biosphere 2 is intended to be 100 years. So any kind of minute increase of pollutants in the soil and water or air and then in the food and in our bodies was unacceptable. And it was a real delight. I mean, we had 40 different crops. Yes, we had un unforeseen insects, devastation. But part of our strategy was integrated pest management, also having lots of cultivars. And soybeans and white potatoes were really devastated by a, an insect we didn't even know before closure. We just substituted with other, other starches and other beans. Now, as a, as a research facility, Pfizer 2 is just amazing because we concentrated all of this life into you know, this very small area. And every closed system has a metabolism. And you know, very quickly in here, <coughs> the, the punchline is, if you calculate the average residence time of the CO2 molecule in the Earth's atmosphere, it stays there for three years. In Biosphere 2, it's between one and four days. Let's take the four days. That means in one year, we have 90 cycles, residence time cycles. And so John Allen you know, actually called by us for two a cyclotron for the life sciences, kind of a time machine. Uh, you know, so we weren't, we, you know, unlike Odysseus, we weren't actually you know, fighting monsters here and going there. We stayed in one place. But in a very strange way, it was a time machine because we were not on Earth rhythms, and some of my, my fellow biospherians absolutely thought that part of the adaptation was we had to get our level of vibration into sync with a sped up biosphere. Okay, the great surprise, oxygen. Now, I love this because at uh, many project meetings, we would ask people, what are your 10 biggest nightmares? No one ever said oxygen might disappear and disappear mysteriously. Very quickly, those, those lines, A is the actual decline of oxygen, which was so slow that it took 16 months to get from 21 to 14 and percent. And B is what we measured in Biosphere 2. The lines F and G are basically the leak rates, for example, in the most tightly sealed NASA facilities. So if we hadn't done what a lot of people thought was impossible, was seal 6,000 panes, two meters on a side of glass, stainless steel liner, to where the entire leak is accounted by one pinky over the entire surface. We had 20 miles of, of, of joints. We wouldn't have seen it. But this was, this was a great, you know, any surprise was another uh, research opportunity. So we were diligently looking for, you know, where did the oxygen go? And again, out of the box answer, it was going into unsealed concrete, or that was the major uh, sequestration. There was an imbalance, also not revolutionary to think, a young, uh, a young biosphere with low biomass and young soils, respiration exceeded uh, photosynthesis. But if it simply had gone into the atmosphere, there wouldn't have been a mystery, and we might not have lasted two years, it should have. But it got absorbed in, in concrete. It was a great illustration that the technosphere is part of the metabolism of Biosphere 2 and, and our planet. So this right, you know, we did all kinds of nutritional studies. Roy Walford, uh, professor at UCLA, his forte was low-calorie, nutrient-dense diets, 
We didn't want to be on it, but we were on his diet for two years, which, you know, gave us that kind of lean and hungry energy. <laughs> and also, you know, oxygen was one of the most amazing things. We take it so much for granted. You know, maybe undersea divers don't and, you know, astronauts don't. But when we finally decided, and it was when Roy couldn't add up a fig, you know, column of figures, we need to put in oxygen. People are already getting sleep apnea. We injected it into one of the lungs, the variable volume things, to make sure that the biosphere didn't explode or implode. And we went in there from 14.5%, and spontaneously, it was like you know rave night. People were running around, laughing, falling down. I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard the sound of a running foot in months. So you know, between the oxygen deprivation, it was an amazing physiological uh, reversal. That was you know, equaled by, as we walked back to the habitat, 14.5%. By the time I had gone up two flights of stairs and into my room, I had gone from this exuberant 20-year-old, I was 45, to 75-year-old where I couldn't finish a sentence like I'm now embarked on without stopping five times. It's amazing what we take for granted, another little lesson from Biosphere 2. And the biomes self-organize rapidly. They, you know, at least doubled in some places. Uh, trees got three times as, as tall. Predictions that everything would homogenize into an urban weed mass, you know, didn't uh, happen. Fog Desert was the big biotic <coughs> surprise. It decided to become a chaparral because it wasn't as dry as a proper fog desert, and we let it go. It was kind of like Biosphere Two is telling us how it wants to evolve. The Biosphere 2 coral reef, you know, not only, you know, survived and reproduced, but it, it was still used by Columbia University, which took over after the closure experiments. And some of the landmark studies in the effects of elevated CO2 and changed ocean chemistry were studies in a system like many things we did at Biosphere 2 that people said you can't do. Fucking work. Okay, I actually added this. Not that I'm a religious man, it's not like the, I got the Koran, but I had a revelation. I, w I was pretty happy. I was the director of space and, and earth applications for the project, on the board of directors and all that kind of stuff. And John Allen uh, in that slide is the first human after we figured out how to seal and did a lot of experiments in the test module. We put him in with great trepidation. And in fact, you know, he had an exuberant time. We, we built up the three-week closures. Then later on, it, it uh, sat there, and our constructed wetland was suffering from lack of nutrients. So first people were told, go and take a piss and crap in, in the test module, because the plants will be happy. Then we decided, let's have everybody on staff and all the biosphere and candidates spend 24 hours in there. And I, I think the revelation was what, like, between five and 10 minutes, I've been in there and I suddenly really got that I am part of this living system and mechanical system. It's so clear when you're in a small closed system, equally true in Biosphere 2, I think it, took, it was a little bit bigger and subtler, but it's suddenly like all of this knowledge, you know, that we may have, for, you know, for good attentive students of ecology, it goes from your head to your body. It's like the cellular, the cellular understanding that you're connected to these plants. And it's amazing, and, and all the life forms in there. So I decided to become a biosphere and candidate, and I was lucky enough to be chosen for the first closure. And I, I think, and of course I had more, more time in the book to explain this, but a lot of the functions and the varied work that we did in there, I think, have some insights into, of course, you all get by now, it shows that word biosphere in, with some malice of forethought, or actually with some benefit of forethought. We're all biospherians, but most of us have no clue. And, you know, even if we know it, it's kind of, you know, peripheral, you know, mental activity. So, yeah, we're all biospherians. So, but in Biosphere 2, we had to become atmospheric stewards, you know, so we actually were working with, with the plants and with capturing sunfall to make sure that, they, uh, that the, uh, the, the, pl the uh, plants inside were using as much of the sunfall as possible. 
We had interbiospheric arts festivals, and we didn't need to be encouraged to celebrate <coughs> because all all eight of us probably were in love with Biosphere Two before we went in, but the love affair was sort of consummated, as it were. When you're in that system and you're you're understanding, I have a vital role to play. These plants aren't going to you know calibrate the sensors and keep bands and machines that break down, but equally so, or maybe even more so, this life support system is keeping me healthy. That gets you into a really interesting state of reality. So I also really wanted to point out, this biospherian thing, and you know, my report from another world is that that's the reality that, you know, probably if I was giving this talk, I wouldn't have a projector, electricity, but you know, if you think about most of human history, people were much more in contact with the earth. The degree of separation, industrial revolution, etc., is really brief. And yeah, so so very you know very profound. So we were the atmospheric stewards. We were also the keystone predators, which meant that you know we went in if vines were threatening biodiversity in the rainforest of Savannah or any of our biomes. We defended, we didn't just, you know, we weren't like objective scientists saying, well, a dying rainforest will produce as much data as a living one. No, hell no, because our health might be in peril, and we love this system. So, back to our visitors, and we kind of realized we're kind of a living exhibit in here, and how, how wonderful. People can watch people who really care about their biosphere. I would say asymptotic to not one plant ever got inadvertently stepped on <laughs> during our time. Although we had to prune them back, you know, we you know we did we did uh, uh, environmental management. We yeah uh, we brewed uh, home brew. You know, we were not Puritans in there. Uh, we also you know, segregated our food. We you know hunger was was kind of a challenge, though we produced great data. But we decided you know we have feasts. And no matter how the group tensions, and there was a power struggle, and all this kind of stuff, there are two chapters in the book, by the way. And the first one, this is from a telex we got from the first Russian in a closed system. Always remember, have courage. Humans are the most unstable element in the ecosystem. <laughs> so there's that chapter, uh, which we explore. And then the other one is the biospherian experience, that, that experience that I still struggle to put into a human language, frankly, of what it is to be viscerally, to be molecularly connected to a biospheric system. Now, if there was any doubt, you know, three steps outside of Biosphere 2 and tasting this curiously, you know, thin atmosphere, you know, from that beautiful, uh, Elevated oxygen is also a little bit of a euphoric, I learned later. Anyway, but of course the pleasure of being back in the Earth's biosphere was amazing. You know, inside we couldn't really see stars, can't see the far horizon, and my God, you know, just like I'm feeling here actually, we get so much energy from other human beings. You know, we really are gregarious monkeys, right? <laughs> so it was amazing. Uh, we had a, a meeting in Siberia, that was the second. We had another one at Biosphere 2. Happy to say, and of course, uh, uh, Sir Ian Prance and I spoke at the Linnaean last week. We had our, our fourth one at the Linnaean Society. And I'm so happy, by the way, that's, that's me with two of the Bios 3 uh, directors of their institute and researchers, that they now have a, a um, portrait of Wallace as the co-discoverer of evolution. Now this, this is kind of like, you know, uh, my work and Ecotechnics work, it's ongoing. So I was in charge of the constructed wetlands, which were how we resupply the nutrients to the systems here. Yeah? I'm so interested, I don't care. Okay. Right. <laughs> Screw it. I don't, I don't know when I started. Anyway. All right. You start to twitch and throw, you know, pa you know paper planes at me if it gets boring. Anyway, so I, I was uh, in charge of the sewage system for a small world, which was so cool, I have to tell you. And what was even cooler was that we had worked with NASA on this. We had this beautiful constructed wetland that, you know, you know it was a great place. Our volunteer frogs, we're not going to get to the, the octopus, but a little warning. We had some uninvited guests. The good news was it wasn't a rattlesnake. 
Yeah. I mean, this was under construction, a really big construction for four years. So I kept on thinking, you know, one of these days on a dark hallway down in our technosphere, I'm going to see a rattlesnake. Anyway, frogs loved this thing. We cut the plants, fed it to our uh, chickens and goats, so we got more egg and, and milk from them. And what was even better was looking at the astonishment of the visitors of Biosphere 2, because this was under, you know, where people went around, that this was a sewage system. So I said, this is great. And it also connects you on a very direct level. So as I mentioned, I went back to the University of Florida, did a PhD with H.D. Odom, and started to build, in fact, this was my dissertation. I said, can we really get away with that? I said, sure, sure, I'm a master in academia. So we built the, our first systems out in Akamal, where we collected the coral. And as Jesse mentioned, let me give another nod to the Heraclitus. The Smithsonian ship ran aground, or I don't know, somehow fell out of action. And the Heraclitus stepped into the breach collected coral that were transported on the back of trucks that were like a, a, a traveling aquarium with lights and nutrient scrubbers. Great story. Anyway, so I went back there and, you know, it was kind of like repaying our debt to the Yucatan Reef. But then we started building them around the world. I started a company called Wastewater Gardens International. And we've had the great fun of taking this system which is so eminently ecological engineering, ecotechnic, low-tech, inexpensive. We teach people how to build it, you know, so they can carry on. And so we've gone to wild places around the world, you know, spreading this technology. And of course, a little book, uh, book plug, some of these wonderful books, the wastewater gardener. So I call these systems wastewater gardens. So they're not reed beds, they're not monocultures. They're, I wanted to make them so ir irresistibly beautiful that hotels and homeowners would say, yes, we, we need to have one. So that's my 20 years in the shit trade. <laughs> After Biosphere, we built a small closed system, this one opaque. That magic size means it could have gone into the shuttle car cargo bay. And we, so we continued doing really more focused on near-term space work for seven or eight years. And I still continue. I edit a uh, journal of life sciences in space. I love this picture. This is like all of the leaders, the head of the European Union with the white silk shirt, I should say, in France. Uh, the head of the, of the NASA work, one of the, the leaders of the, the now Russian work in the field, and two Chinese. And I think it's so great because there are two Chinese groups that are now really pushing the envelope for those interested in bioregenerative life support uh, systems. Google Lunar Palace because they just had a closure for one year with three people inside. And I think, you know, one of, one of my, um, my points in sort of wrapping up is we've got to change our biosphere paradigm. You know, as I was mentioning before, not to really embrace that we are connected to our global biosphere, that we're dependent on it, that, you know, that it is you know, a source of mystery and wonder, you know, every advanced, i.e., you know, so-called earlier culture regards the earth as sacred. You know, the Buddhists say the first step in a path of, of awakening is to change your thinking. So I think we have to change our thinking, and I really invite everyone, and, you know, I, I know a lot of you out there are working in environmentally related things, and. Uh, by the way, also artists and <coughs> myth makers, musicians. We also need people to celebrate our connection with, with our biosphere and, and the glory of it. So I hate the word, the environment. It's so bad because just the way it's structured makes it think that the environment is something outside of us. That's illusion. Every breath that we take has been expelled and reduced, or has been produced by photosynthetic uh, both bacteria and algae in the ocean and plants. You know, we are metabolically, spiritually, evolutionarily connected to the biosphere. And I think, I hope, you know, with ecotechnics, with ecological engineering, with the Vernadsky understanding really of, you know, what's happening on the biosphere, what a powerful force it is, and the necessity to start to manage the human, us humans, in our relationship to it, 
I see the Anthropocene as a really long era, and I think we're in sort of the painful birthing process of that. So pushing our limits uh, available after the talk, and, and there will be some supply at the October Gallery. Through your favorite bookseller, I went on Amazon UK. They say it usually ships in one to two months, but they list other alternatives. It's an e-book. Eurospan is the distributor. And just in closing, as I think, I hope I've persuaded you, I think that you know, the, these approaches, and you know, I didn't even mention appropriate technology, I think there's a huge uh, upwelling of understanding. I, you know, when I speak to young people, see the people who volunteer, they're so much more advanced in understanding you know, what the situation is, and understanding that what we do with the earth is kind of their bequeath and all of our bequeath you know, to succeeding generations, that we have the tools, just like we started Ecotechnics with willing incompetence, with the determination that we can do a lot better than business as usual, as it's called now. And you know, I used to use the word sustainable, and you know, just like sustainable development always struck me as kind of semi-oxymoronic. I really think that the, the, the word is, and in uh, organic and natural approaches to farming, regenerative agriculture is now kind of the, the word. And I think when you think about you know, the condition of our planet right now, it's not good enough just to sustain it. We have to regenerate it. We need to decide what kind of a biosphere we're going to live with and basically act to bring that about. And as I end my book, another reason for hope, and let me, let me say in passing, if you think I'm optimistic, that's a yoga. You need to make sure that you remain optimistic because every, I mean, it's kind of a truism. We really learned that in Biosphere 2. There is no anonymous actions. We have allies. The biosphere is on our side. Thank you. Mark, um, well, thank you very, very much. I'm not even going to comment on that. I'm just going to um, throw the discussion open to anybody from the floor if you have any particular questions. Um, Marcus. Some answers to many things. Please. Let, let, me, let me give you this. Thank you for your um, talk. Um, it was very brief. Um, this maybe it's an unfair question, but I can't help but ask it. Um, how, how long did it take before you actually felt that? <coughs> Inside Visor 2, pretty fast. But you know, I think the Visor 2 experience was so much the richer because I was kind of a transient occupant of the test module. I went in there for 24 hours, I cooked some food that was grown there, I helped fertilize that constructed wetland. But I think, you know, the, which I think is a hopeful thing, you know, having, you know, having that understanding of the connection go cellular gets deepened as you interact with your world. And, and in fact, I actually kind of bestowed the word biosphere on you all, but I'm actually, you know, thinking, I've been, you know, kind of meditating on what are the, what are the implications of being a biosphere in. And I, I think it's kind of like, well, you know, you could be a citizen, but if you don't really work with your community and vote and, you know, do, you know, do things that are good for, at the local level and you know have an impact. I think the same is true about a biosphere. The biosphere, and you know, you really earn that concept or that term if, first off, you kind of mull on what it means to you to be a biosphere in planet Earth, a member, a metabolic partner with our global biosphere. And I think because in biosphere too, we had all those roles to, to play. See, I have, I have little tolerance for like the deep ecologists. Well, let, let me back off and not just get negative. Ecotechnics, you know, kind of started by saying, look, we're totally for protecting really valuable parts of the planet. And I'm sympathetic with E.O. Wilson. He wrote a book called Half Earth. Yeah. 
you know, that we may need to do that. I think the really scary thing is we actually don't know what the limits are and how much can be converted to anthropogenic use before we hit a limit. But I think the more fundamental is, do we really want to live in a world without rainforests, without savannas, without, you know, places where there may be human impact, but, you know, they're not dominated and serving human interests? So all of the roles that we had in Biosphere 2, so I, I dislike people who just say, Humans are a parasitic cancer, and Biosphere will be happier with that. No, we are an evolutionary product of it. We can't write ourselves out of history. And I think we have a destiny. And maybe I'll just put a one liner. When I was mulling over what does biospheric mean, I think it's kind of key to how we live on Earth successfully, and how we take, you know, when we go into space, if, if and when, I think it's more when, we go into space, we're going to take many biospheres with us. We're going to take Earth life with us because, well, now we know we're not even an, an individual human organism. We have at least as many microbial cells. So all of the work that we did to keep the machinery going, to research it, to document it, to defend up biodiversity, to help manage the atmosphere, deepened that cellular connection. <laughs> I'm I'm wired so I shouldn't do that. <laughs> so so yeah, so so become, becoming a biospherian is kind of I think a process and it starts with really and I'll show my age grokking, that was a big term in the sixties, really getting to some kind of <coughs> understanding of epiphany or you know, or actually go out in nature and really experience what happens when you're there and understand that right in the middle of London even if you don't see a green plant, you are metabolically connected and you're, you are part of this biosphere. Um, yeah, well, I've got a few more, but, but please, please, follow that one. Um, I'm a very old friend of Rupert Sheldrake and my publisher ended up as the publisher of the Eden Project. So I've known about you for a long time and it's a privilege to hear the dramatis personae talking from inside the plot. Um, Thinking about native biomes, I was recently on the Napo River in Ecuador, and um, I came across um, a dilemma which exists between the biome you have there and what's up the road, which is the Taos Pueblo and the atomic bomb project. Um, in terms, of, uh, the question is actually about the danger we've produced on the Earth, we have, and how you deal with fear. I mean, when I look at that, I think it's not nuclear hardened. Um, and when I was um, down on the Napa River, we got way late on the river because the water level was down. We found ourselves in the middle of a chicha party at a rather hostile tribe, and we were there for quite a long time. And these, the emotional level was very, very high among these people. We were the only people with deet and t fa t uh, fabric on, and uh, the, uh, two or three of the braves gathered around my wife, and they started saying most aggressively to her, you are responsible for nuclear weapons in this world. And that took me back to a nuclear organization that I did with a whole bunch of atomic bomb people. And we were talking about security screens, lost submarines, and whatever. And it was meant to be cross-disciplinary. And quite soon, the humanities people left the room. Because if you start talking about what we've made here on the planet and the level of violence we have, um, you talk about scientists wanting to go out of that. But when you actually get conscious, scientists talking about what's actually going on inside the nuclear state, the levels of fear become almost unmanageable. They can deal with it because they deal with pure reason. How do we deal with that? I mean, how do you how do you deal with danger and fear? I mean, fear is what we have to ultimately confront. And those native people down in the NATO, they didn't have any trouble talking about fear because that's where their emotional level was. But that is not a, that's not in the biome. It's that we we are, we've been in a sense acculturated by science not to feel those things. We're in a denial. So how do you deal with that element of fear? Well, you know, when I, when I was talking about optimism, I certainly didn't mean fatuous optimism. You know, we're, we're very aware, you know, that if Los Alamos goes in a nuclear uh, explosion, you know, we're, we're, we're toast. So I, I think, as I, as I said earlier, we have lots of reasons to be really concerned. I mean, super concerned. I think, you know, it's it's... Not an exaggeration to say that you know our generations and the next few are pivotal. We have never pushed the biosphere this far. I totally agree with you. And in the book, I'm thinking, you know, that you know what people have called for in terms of changing our technology and stopping global warming. That's a pittance compared to what 
we spend on warfare. So, yeah, I mean, common sense. I mean, I also think, you know, all of us humans, we are survivors. You know, our, our genes have made it through, you know. So I'm not saying to be stupid. I mean, common sense, that I should have added that, actually. Willing incompetence and some common sense was like a base requirement. <laughs> so, yeah, but the thing is, you know, not to give into it. But I think that, that we should be motivated because it's a scary situation on planet Earth, including the militarism. And it, you know, I, I ponder, you know, are we really just an aggressive, violent, you know, homicidal, fratricidal species? But I think that's a secondary truth of humanity. I go with Wilhelm Reich, that the primary one is that, you know, we're loving and we reach out, that it's distorted cultures and you know, we can kind of see that. I mean, when I say redesign the technosphere, that includes pretty much everything. I mean, even scarier to me, uh, well, nuclear weapons, you know, that's kind of a showstopper. That's where maybe other species, you know, will evolve to take our place. But when I was researching the chapter on chemical uh, industries mm -hmm. and the amount of synthetic uh, chemicals, it is really totally horrifying, and I, I came across this, and I'll just repeat it because I was, I was so as I think they say that here they do in Australia gobsmacked smack, mm -hmm. that the U.S. EPA has only banned like three or four substances. Most of the chemicals they get manufactured and put into wide supply don't even get tested at any rudimentary level. So I think the fundamental rechanging of how we live and interact. It's got to extend, we have to rethink every decision that's happened since the industrial age, and warfare is even more profound. But, you know, there is a huge amount of work to be done. There is a reason to be alarmed. I think fear is not a great motivator. Be alarmed, be aware of the situation, and understand how important it is that you sort of get off the, <coughs> the sidelines, and then, you know, step by step. I think if we had people, I often thought, you know, for example, in Biser 2, I was kind of saying there were no anonymous actions. We found that doing a plumbing repair, which might be needed if something was broken or to improve the irrigation to make the plants happier here or there, that re would release, because we're using solvents and glues, chemicals into our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We had a complete analytic laboratory, so we could, we could see, we were getting regular reports on everything in our air, everything in our water. So literally, okay, I want to make the irrigation better in Savannah. Okay, Tabor, you're in charge of the analytic lab. You know, we know that these compounds are released. What, what are the levels? Maybe we have to wait for a week, you know, until it's that kind of sensitivity. And I think we have somehow, I'm going to get off nuclear because I don't have any magic explosion, frankly. But I had a friend who was the uh, editor of the LA Weekly, and he kind of you know, caused a stir, and I think other, other magazines and have done this. He sent his guys into supermarkets to see food that was you know, stamped by the USDA, sent it to a laboratory to see really what was in that. If city dwellers saw what was in our air and water, and we could pinpoint, you know, we kind of know which industries are doing that. But we have gotten so numb that we think it's acceptable. I mean, I know when I come from New Mexico, we're 20 miles out of Santa Fe, to London, I know my organism starts to take shallow breaths because I understand I am not in New Mexico. I'm in London. So, you know, at some point we have to, you know, we're in the Anthropocene. This is going to go on a long time. You know, we have to start to collectively say it's not acceptable. It's not. It's not acceptable for an industry to produce something that they claim is you know making life so much better and blah 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 blah. If it is damaging our vital life support, our air, water, and food. I think. I think the uh, conversation will go on. I hope it will go on. Um, I'm going to take one more from John. John, please. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, first of all, for having demonstrated in such detail that the purpose of a scientific experiment is not to reach a foregone conclusion, 
but to, uh, well, there's there's been a, a a delight on the on the part of the media to to uh, uh, to call it uh, uh, by here to a failure, as if the object were to run the four minute mile when it had taken you four minutes and thirty seconds. The, what in in fact you've shown a successful scientific experiment is one which yields the maximum amount of useful information for the, for, the, for the future. And you have also demonstrated in microcosm that survival in a fixed system relies ultimately on cooperation rather than on competition. Thank you, John. Thank you. And I was going to make a quick final comment, and John has done it for me, so I'm going to save those precious moments. Um, the teller told his tale. Um, a quick hand for Mark Nelson.